Welcome to EuroPCR 2019. My name is Marco Roffi from Geneva, and I'm pleased to be here with Christian Pristipino from Rome, Italy. And we would like to uh, discuss together some very interesting points about uh, PFO, patent foramen ovale, and especially PFO closure. So, welcome, Christian. Thank you very much, Marco. Maybe just to start uh, to make some uh, definitions. We hear uh, frequently the definition of uh, cryptogenic stroke. So what does it mean? And uh, if a patient has uh, indeed uh, this type of stroke and the PFO, should he still be considered to have a cryptogenic stroke or not? Well, that's a question that now has been addressed by uh, randomized studies. And now the, the, the answer is very clear because uh, uh, in recent meta-analysis just published in our uh, consensus uh, paper, position paper, European position paper published uh, uh, last year, uh, we have focused that uh, there is a superiority now of closure, uh, closing, closing the PFO uh, against uh, just medical therapy. This means that the PFO is really one of the possible causes of uh, uh, stroke. Therefore, uh, when a patient has a PFO and a, a stroke, which is not, which has no cl very clear, uh, clear cut uh, causes, then it should be considered as a, 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 an independent uh, nosologic uh, entity. So PFO related uh, stroke. Exactly. So obviously before you come to this diagnosis, you have to have an extensive uh, evaluation, yeah. a workup. So please summarize for us what are uh, the mainstays of this workup. Yeah, well, uh, once uh, you have a, PF, a stroke that uh, uh, with no clear causes, uh, once you have excluded very clear causes, um, at this stage you should search for also for a PFO because it is, uh, uh, despite it is an established uh, uh, cause of uh, stroke, uh, it is still infrequent. Therefore, you should first uh, assess for other reasons of uh, uh, stroke. Once you have excluded them, or they are not very clear cut, for example, you have a 50, 60% stenosis of the carotid arteries, uh, or uh, you have uh, uh, not clear uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, then you can look for, uh, you should look for a PFO. Uh, so maybe I interrupt you, yeah. just to, this makes us uh, realize that the, the, the care of those patients should be multidisciplinary. Yeah, exactly. Because obviously Absolutely. they have a neurologic event and frequently we know that this may be very difficult even for a stroke neurologist to understand whether or not symptoms may be ischemia related and also to interpret imaging, brain imaging, to see whether Absolutely. Uh, lesion is embolic, uh, yes or no. Obviously, we need the neurologist. Also, in your document and uh, here at, uh, at PCR, it was stressed the concept of the heart-brain uh, team. And obviously, this, uh, there is extensive evaluation from neurologic side and from cardiac side. So maybe uh, let's focus on the cardiac portion. Yeah. What are the characteristics that make you think that an event... Uh, was indeed uh, PFO related. Well, th there are um, characteristics that have been assessed by randomized trials, and uh, those are the, uh, what now is called the high-risk PFO features, meaning uh, the uh, atrial septal aneurysm, the, um, and the, the magnitude of the of the shunt. So the larger the, the shunt, the, larger the greatest, the, shunt, the, the, greatest the risk. And the, 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 the bigger the, the septal aneurysm movement, the, biggest, the, the, the bigger the, the, the risk as well. Uh, those are the only two, um, only three, let's say, uh, characteristics that have been assessed in randomized studies, but there are several others. 
uh, that can be uh, assessed as well. The clinical situation, for example, uh, you can have a clinical situation that uh, happened a stroke uh, after a long immobilization or uh, it's a travel it's very suggestive, and uh, it's very suggestive yes. of paradoxical embolism. So uh, you should, of course, focus on uh, high risk features, but you have to keep them in balance with all other uh, features that have not, has not been assessed by randomized studies, but yet there are uh, big evidence. You can find the big list in, yes. in the document, the European. Document. I'm sure, I'm sure. And obviously we encourage everybody to read this excellent consensus paper uh, that was done by EIPCI and you were the first author. Congratulations. So uh, obviously atrial fibrillation is one of the main causes of uh, ischemic uh, embolic uh, stroke. So how, uh, let's say, aggressive should uh, you look for atrial fibrillation in patients with suspected uh, PFO associated stroke? And what are the, are there any uh, characteristic uh, uh, of the patient that make you more or less aggressive in uh, looking for atrial fibrillation? Of course, uh, atrial fibrillation, as you know, is the first cause of uh, stroke, uh, cardiac cause of stroke. Therefore, it is, it's mandatory to exclude uh, significant events of atrial fibrillation. Uh, in young patients, the, the incidence of atrial fibrillation is trivial, therefore there is no need for extensive evaluation of atrial fibrillation, just uh, in basi basal ECG and uh, prolonged monitoring of one or two days uh, where is possible. Otherwise, an alter ECG for 24, for, uh, 24 hours is uh, largely enough. Um, for people that are above 65 years old of age, as many other um, risk factors overlap with other causes of stroke, it is important to really exclude very uh, uh, precisely uh, the atrial fibrillation. Therefore, an implantable, an, an implantable cardiac monitor could be really uh, indicated. So this is a very important message. The older the patient, the greater the probability that atrial fibrillation is involved, so the more prolonged should be the uh, rhythm monitoring before exactly. ruling out atrial fibrillation and going for, uh, to PFO closure. Especially because there is a randomized trial that showed that in people with uh, uh, cryptogenic stro or stroke of uh, uh, undetermined origin, um, as much as 25% of patients has a, an underdiagnosed uh, atrial fibrillation. This is a very important point. So the next uh, controversial issue is uh, should you uh, have a screening for thrombophilia in all patients with a suspected uh, PFO-associated uh, stroke? Well, uh, the, the, of course, thrombophilia can be uh, something that when it's present, even more uh, pushes for a, a PFO closure because once you are more predisposed to forming thrombi, you would like to stop the thrombi to possibly being a paradoxical. Uh, therefore, but I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to uh, challenge you because uh, if somebody qualifies yeah. for a, a prolonged or lifelong anticoagulation, yeah. does but the patient all... need uh, also PFO closure yeah, that's if the you problem. plan to anticoagulate him lifelong? Yeah, that's the problem, because uh, there are no strong evidences on the treatment of these uh, prothrombotic states. Therefore, there is a big uncertitude among, between uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant treatment, how long, and this is uh, much of the problem. Therefore, uh, with the European Society of Hematology that contributed to the document, uh, uh, to the European document, it was focused that uh, really as a routine surgery for thrombophilic uh, um, uh, pre predisposition shouldn't be uh, looked for uh, uh, routinely. So but very strong message, again, one <coughs> more. So there is no indication for routine thrombophilia screening in all patients not only, suspected. Not only, but it's contraindicated. So to no indication for, for that. So this is uh, a clear statement. And maybe the final point I would like to address with you is the... Uh, um, following PFO closure, what is the antiplatelet regimen 
which uh, your uh, document, uh, the consensus, uh, recommend? Well, um, regarding the, the, the pharmacological treatment, uh, besides uh, PFO closure, it's very important to, to remember that uh, uh, neo-endocardialization of the device occurs between six months and up to five years. Therefore, uh, the closure, the, the randomized data showed also that the PFO closure doesn't pre does prevent uh, uh, major strokes, but does not prevent minor TIAs. Therefore, um, we, uh, the main per interpretation that is given to this data is that the neoendocardialization, uh, despite rare, can still give, uh, when it is delayed, uh, TIA if you withdraw mm -hmm. too early the, the, uh, the drugs. Therefore, uh, our document, based on the fact that all positive trials had uh, a prolonged uh, um, antiplatelet therapy up to five years, uh, we indicated, we suggested to, um, to use antiplate, one single antiplatelet agent up to five years, whether clopidogrel or aspirin remains up to the to the operator to be chosen but at least one uh, up to five years and a double antiplatelet therapy between three and six months uh, also based on uh, on uh, randomized trial designs so just to to, to uh, the people understand uh, correctly so although there is no uh, randomized <coughs> study exactly. comparing two different regimen in antiplatelet therapy following pfo closure yeah based on the fact that the, the, positive uh, in the, in the, the positive ones had a duration of treatment that was prolonged, the statement of yeah. the consensus is to go uh, beyond the, the duration of dual therapy for maybe five years or something yeah. like that. Yeah, because the, the treatment that were compared in a randomized trial was not closure versus yes. ter medical therapy, but was closure plus the medical therapy okay. against so, medical therapy alone stating that the efficacy was uh, uh, um, documented in this, with this background antithrombotic exactly. treatment. Exactly. This is what now is suggested following exactly. PFA closure. Suggested, but so, because there is no strong evidence coming from specifically designed randomized trials, which are still needed. Perfect. Christian, I thank, thank you very, very much, much for this very interesting uh, discussion. Thank and you, uh, I wish you all a very good uh, meeting.